Why should people pay Omba a 0.3% fee to build a portfolio of ETFs when they can just do it themselves and save themselves the fee? The reason is quite simple in our view. So I actually think if people have the time and the expertise and the wherewithal, etc., to go and build their own portfolio of ETFs, a global portfolio, I highly recommend it. It's a, it's a great thing to do. It would keep costs down. But, and and it, it, you'd enjoy the experience of learning about global markets. But the reality is that people have their jobs. And if they're retired, they want to enjoy their retirement and play, play golf, go sailing, go to the bush, climb a mountain, whatever they do for a hobby. And we effectively cater to that universe of people that either don't have the time, expertise, or don't want to because they want to do and have fun with their money, not worry about investing it. And so what we believe is that we, we charge a very modest fee of 0.3%. And it includes a whole host of things we do in the process. The first of which is choosing ETFs is not such an easy task. With over 7,000 ETFs in the world and all these different types of ETFs, you need a specialist to consider all these things like liquidity of the ETF. Is it physically backed or synthetic? Is the issuer credible? Is the, is, is the ETF likely to close because it's too small? What is the bid offer spread on the ETF? What is the primary and secondary market liquidity on the ETF? So there are a host of considerations first to choose the ETFs. People can go and research all that for themselves, but we've been doing it now nearly for 10 years. So that's step one. We do the research on the ETFs. The second thing we do is we do think, and this is the point about us trying to add our own skill and alpha to the process, we do think the world presents opportunities to own things when they become cheap. So due to geopolitics, due to macroeconomic factors, due to dislocations in valuation, bad news, headlines, etc., asset prices can move up and down. Take you know, examples like protests in a particular region or threatening of a trade war between X and Y. Various markets can move up and down. And when those events are, or monetary policy, central banks have changed their tack on a particular thinking relating to hiking or cutting interest rates. When those things are occurring in the world, asset prices often present an opportunity to buy them at a discount. And so we think our tactical process, which, which I'll elaborate on at length if you wish, essentially allows us to take advantage of these dislocations. And so we had hoped to add 1% to 2% of skill and alpha on top of just owning the world passively through this process of, of buying things which become cheap. And then the final thing is, and the third point, is that we have a very robust monitoring and rebalancing process. And I can elaborate at, at length on this, but there are really two schools of thought on, on monitoring and rebalancing. You get percentage of portfolio theory, which says, when, if your target allocation is 50-50, if you deviate by X percent, let's say 2% out of your tolerance band, so it goes to 53 and 47 weighting, you automatically rebalance back to 50. And there's a, a lot of academic literature on percentage of portfolio rebalancing. And then the other theory is calendar rebalancing. So on calendar periods, weekly, daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, annually, whatever you choose, you, can, you just rebalance to target irrespective. You don't consider the percentage changes. When one looks at a lot of the academic literature on these theories, most of which has typically been done between, for example, US Treasuries and the S&P, or it's been done between UK GILTs and the FTSE 100, or it's been done between the Stock 600 and BUNs, or it's been done between JGBs and, and the Nikkei, a lot of the academic research is essentially uh, centric to the region or country. Very few researchers have done the, the research on global portfolios and multi-asset portfolios from a global context. But when you read through all the literature, one has to consider a number of things on portfolio rebalancing. You don't want to trade too frequently, so you want to keep costs down because you don't want to incur unnecessary commissions. So that's an argument for keeping bands wider. It's also an argument for keeping calendar periods wider, not too frequent. And you have to consider other factors like, you know, not catching a falling knife too early. If markets are falling, they could trend lower for quite a while. Similarly, if markets are rallying, they could rally for quite a while. So you don't want to, if, if your 50-50 bond equity mix was 53-47 in, in favor of equities, immediately cut back to 50. And vice versa, if your equities have fallen from 50 to 45%, you know, they could end up becoming 40% of the portfolio because the market's trending down. So you, what we've done is we've embraced both schools of thought. And we have a very robust process which looks we do calendar quarterly rebalancing and we keep our tolerance bands reasonably wide. So we don't trade unnecessarily or too frequently and we allow the market to move within that band. But if there's a big dislocation, for example, when Brexit was announced, the FTSE fell nearly 20%, that would be an example of saying, hang on, our UK allocation, it's 
down 20%. It's a significant move. It's an intra-quarter period. We have a trigger. Consider topping up or maybe even tactically overweighting the UK at that moment in time. So we're looking at these tolerance bands at a security level, at a sub-asset class level, and then at the higher level asset class between bond and equity. And that's really the third reason why we think it's important to consider these factors in portfolio construction and, and monitoring. And I think for point three fee, if you factor in those three things, it's a significant, uh, a, signif a very good deal.